Hey, get, we're going to get started. Um, I, I know there'll be, what do they always call it, a late arriving crowd, um, but I appreciate your coming. Uh, to the faculty in internal medicine, please make sure you've signed in. Uh, we're, we're starting, today's our new year um, and uh, new academic year, and so I've asked that the faculty who receive salary support um, some way either through Erlanger or through UT or some payment arrangement or whatever, to go to at least four, um, uh, uh, four uh, grand rounds this year, otherwise they're at risk for losing their uh, salary support. So if you, could, if you could sign in, I'd really appreciate it, and so that way we'd know who's here. But uh, without further ado, it's 8 o'clock. My commitment is to start on time and end on time. Dr. Campbell's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Larry Shears to you today. Larry uh, is my partner and co-director of the Erlinger Heart and Lung Institute. He's going to speak to you about cardiac surgery. This is really boring. And it's going to feel like four grand rounds. So for those of you that, that receive faculty support, you'll probably have all of your grand rounds at the end of this today. This is really, I mean, this is pathetic stuff. Larry comes to us from York, Pennsylvania. Prior to that, he was in Pittsburgh, where they have a reputation for doing a little bit of cardiac surgery. He was there for a long time as a, as a resident uh, and then as a ju junior faculty member. Um, prior to that, he was in West Virginia, uh, and where, he, where he completed his undergraduate and medical training. Larry's brought an entirely new approach to cardiac surgery to the region, not just with the uh, robotic surgeries, which I think he'll probably tell you a little bit about, but minimally invasive surgery as well. Additionally, his program in York was um, meticulous about outcomes and meticulous about how patients were managed, and they were able to garner in a, in a, in a rural environment the best ratings that the uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons uh, offers for programs. So these were the reasons that, uh, that I was attracted to um, the idea of getting to work with Larry. I think there are some other things that should be noted that there are a lot of similarities between Larry and I. Uh, he runs marathons. I really don't, do I? I haven't actually run one. I thought about it. Uh, he's a rock climber. Now there's no similarities between Larry and I. Uh, I have, have really uh, enjoyed having him be a part of this team. It has been a great partnership. Without further ado, Larry Shears. I'd like to thank everybody for inviting me here to give the grand rounds uh, this morning. Uh, I'm just going to lead in with this. Um. In my family, you know, we're, we're a pretty active family from, you know, t hiking in the summer together, uh, playing pond hockey in the winter, our whole family's involved. It's just awesome. I was playing uh, soccer over in Lancaster in a men's over 30 league, and middle of the game, I started to get just some crushing chest pain. Got the tinkling down both arms, actually started getting pain in my jaw, and I thought, oh my word, am I having a heart attack? Walked off the field, didn't say anything to anybody. It, it never went away. And anytime I did anything active, physical, whether it was running around with the yards with the kids, mowing, uh, do a lot of hunting, fishing, active outdoors, anytime basically where I got my heart rate up, I would get that crushing pain. So finally I told my wife, I said, you know, something, this isn't right. I was pulling out of the driveway and my phone rang and it was my husband and he could hardly talk, you know. So I stopped the car in the driveway and, you know, he basically said, I, I took the stress test and the cardiologist is saying that you need to come here. You know, Dr. Shriver pulled the curtain back and basically like, good news is you're here, bad news is you're getting bypassed first thing tomorrow morning. I was a mess. I, I was crying the whole way through it. He was emotional. I'm thinking of my three children in the background, my wife. I'm like, I'm 38. Is this supposed to happen at 38? It, you know, it was terrifying. Scariest thing I've ever heard and went through. And then along came another surgeon, great doctor, Dr. Larry Shears, and he basically came in and introduced me to a machine called Da Vinci. And thank goodness because it 
that machine and him basically saved my life. Basically, I spent two days in the hospital. I had it done on a Friday morning. Dr. Shears released me Sunday morning. From that day forward, from that, basically coming out of the recovery room, I never had the chest pain again. I'm just thankful that he's here and he's healthy and that he can run and be pain free. I think about my family. A lot is even I'm running, I'm like, I could have been gone. I, I was really close to permanently checking out. This Christmas was, you know, I, it was very emotional for me because it was like, I could be a widow this Christmas with my three children. You know, he could not be here. So it's just good to have him. This is a, a good testimonial for, for lots of reasons, but it, it, it sort of highlights uh, uh, the importance of what we're uh, here and what we're doing. and and also the impact that it has on families uh, and uh, the concern. You can just feel the, the stress in, in their voices. Um, and it also gives a sort of a highlight as to where we're going with, uh, with this talk and also some of the misconceptions about the treatment of coronary uh, disease. But coronary disease today still is a, a huge problem in the United States. Uh, one and a half million uh, people suffer MIs in, in a country each year, and it's counting for over a half, uh, uh, half a million uh, deaths a, a year. The causes for it are, are fairly obvious, uh, particularly in this region, the sedentary lifestyles, the, uh, the use of tobacco, uh, the dietary indiscretions, uh, the genetic makeup of, of the region. All these things uh, play a role in the, in the development of the coronary artery disease. Now the title of my talk is uh, Cabbage, uh, When Carrots Don't Work, and you may be wondering where that uh, comes from. Um, this slide here is, uh, is uh, I'm gonna use to introduce where the, the topic came from, but I just came back from vacation where this is in Rouen, which is in uh, uh, sort of Western France, and if uh, the history majors in the room would remember, that this is where Joan of Arc uh, was actually uh, burned at the stake. Uh, her crime was heresy. Uh, she was uh, instrumental in leading the uh, battles to restore Charles VII back to the rightful uh, king of, of France after the Hundred Years' War. And the heresy, for, for me as an interventionalist and as a heart surgeon, I'm strictly an interventionalist, any talk of preventative medicine could only be considered to be heresy. And particularly with this plant-based uh, diet type thing, uh, I don't know how we could describe it any, any other way. Now, Dr. Bailey may someday be canonized, but my hope is that it wouldn't be for this uh, plant-based diet uh, stuff. There are others, fortunately, that are more rational in the Department of uh, uh, Cardiology, uh, one who's really trying to suggest that you can prevent uh, dementia by a, a meat-based diet. And uh, you can see the enthusiasm of this investigator, especially um, when he found out this was actually a pepperoni roll shaped as a, as a, um, a, a pretzel. And he's really uh, can't wait to get there. He's having a hard time getting people to uh, agree to be second author. Here you see Chuck's not too thrilled about the possibility of being second author on this type of a paper. It's, uh, the things happen during the talk, so I'm going to give you the take-home points here early. Uh, sometimes carrots are enough. And when I talk about carrots from here on out, what I'm talking about is the optimal medical therapy. Stents aren't always bad. That's a hard one for me to, to get out. Uh, Real-life application of randomized prospective trials is difficult and can be dangerous. And truly, for the treatment of coronary artery disease in today's world, I think that a heart team approach needs to be used in the management of these uh, patients. A little bit of the history of coronary uh, artery surgery. The, the first talks of, of doing coronary bypass was uh, from Alexis Correll. He's instrumental in having uh, developed the, uh, the anastomotic techniques that we use in vascular surgery and coronary surgery. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for this work in 1912. He was writing about the potential of coronary surgeries early as 1908. The first surgeries to treat ischemic uh, coronary disease come from uh, Arthur Weinberg. There are uh, probably very few people around who have actually seen a Weinberg uh, procedure. Uh, 
some of the cardiologists, the senior cardiologists back where I was uh, located had done casts on these and said they actually did work. And basically, you weren't bypassing the blood vessel. You're just taking the left mammary uh, and uh, taking it down and just tunneling it through the muscle of the myocardium. And on the right-hand side there, you see where you get this neovascularization and can reestablish re blood by, uh, supply to an ischemic territory. This is getting a little bit more interest now with angiogenesis factors and, and uh, stem cell therapy to see if those in conjunction with uh, a Weinberg procedure could result in significant um, uh, treatment of angina. Uh, the first actual uh, bypasses were really done by uh, Vladimir Demikov, uh, a Russian scientist who uh, was noted for taking these animals um, and uh, actually transplanting the, the, the head and upper body onto another dog. Um, he's really the, at the forefront of, of heart-lung um, uh, transplant uh, surgery. But he, in 1952, had done bypass surgeries using the limits of the LAD in dogs and had shown two-year patency rates uh, in that particular operation, which is pretty phenomenal given that it really didn't have heart-lung machines at the time, and the dog's artery is pretty small. But it was confirmed by Maurice Saviston and Getz in the United States as well. You really couldn't do bypass surgery until you found a way to, to actually get a roadmap to see where the blockages were and what you would actually would have to bypass. Sones in 1959 actually performed the first uh, coronary angiography uh, accidentally. He was doing an, aortic, uh, an aortogram for uh, rheumatic uh, heart disease and saw that the catheter was in the right uh, coronary artery. He asked them to withdraw it, but accidentally the dye got uh, put into the uh, vessel, and this is what the angiogram looked like. The patient uh, immediately went uh, asystolic and almost died, but he was able to get the patient to cough before he went totally out, and that uh, interthoracic pressure drew, drove it out, and the patient survived. But after seeing that you could do that, that's when uh, Soans at the Cleveland Clinic really started doing coronary angiography. The guy who's accredited for doing the, inventing the aortic coronary bypass surgery is uh, Favalero at the Cleveland Clinic. With having Soans there, they were able to do the angiograms uh, and really build a, a huge program there. Uh, initially, what they were doing was uh, an endarterectomy and then doing a patch angioplasty. The problem with that was you had a 65% mortality if they were do done on the left-sided grafts. And so he eventually went ahead and started doing an aortic coronary by bypass using uh, vein grafts. And this is a picture of one of his very first uh, ones. He presented the data in 1967 of 180 patients on whom they'd done uh, venous bypasses uh, through an aortic coronary uh, approach. It wasn't until 1974, actually, uh, though, that Saviston admitted that he had actually done the first one as early as 1962. Uh, he didn't report that because that patient uh, died of a perioperative stroke and because of some ethnic issues related to it, the, this data was never presented. Uh, and then also DeBakey and Garrett uh, uh, also uh, admitted that in 1964 they had actually successfully performed an aortic coronary bypass but hadn't reported it. While coronary surgery was developing, at the same time there's a separate camp looking at trying to do this through um, angioplasty techniques. Uh, Dr. Dodder was working in Oregon and working with uh, balloons and also accidentally uh, blowing up a balloon in the aorta, trying to do an aortogram. Uh, it had gotten stuck in the renal artery that was known to be stenotic and when he brought the balloon down realized that he'd opened the vessel up. So he started doing more investigating work in his first uh, approach was in 1964 to do uh, to balloon angioplasty and SFA in an 82-year-old lady who had a non-healing uh, foot ulcer and, and was having rest pain. The, right, er, the person on the right, um, Andreas uh, Grunzig, uh, saw that work and started thinking about using this for coronary work. Uh, he was in Germany, he was basically ostracized, moved to Switzerland to, to help develop uh, better balloons and then came to the United States where he was doing these in San Francisco on open bypass surgeries. They would open the artery and he'd put the balloon in and, and blow it up. 
uh, and showed that actually you could uh, get these vessels open. You'd bypass them immediately afterwards. Uh, but it was a proof of principle. And then he and uh, Spencer King from uh, Emory were on a train and talking, and, and Spencer uh, King uh, convinced Grunzig to come to the United States. So in 1980, Grunzig actually came to uh, Emory University uh, and started the, the world of uh, 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 PTCA in the United States. And then uh, over time, we, we knew that PTCA itself uh, was not uh, having good durable results. And in 1986, the first stents uh, were designed and started to be implanted. Uh, this was by Puel and Zigbert uh, in, uh, in France. So ever since then, we have the two camps. We have uh, a percutaneous method with stenting. We have surgery. Uh, and uh, from that point in time, there's always been those, those grudge matches of who's got the best uh, uh, therapy. And throughout the rest of the talk, what I want to do is take you through the evolution of our current uh, concepts on uh, revascularization. So cabbage versus the carrot or, or optimal uh, medical therapy. One of the first studies is the CAS study. Uh, and basically what you're looking at uh, in that study is randomizing patients to surgery versus uh, optimal medical therapy. These are, uh, by definition, low-risk patients. They're younger patients because, uh, um, as my uh, senior cardiologist uh, back in York used to say, we didn't even cathy one over the age of 65 until the uh, mid-'80s. Very, It was pretty uh, uh, rare uh, because there weren't good uh, uh, options for them other than surgery, and they weren't going to send anyone over 65 to surgery. So most of these are young patients, they have stable angina, and they were randomized to either surgery or optimal medical therapy. And what you see uh, in these slides, uh, I don't have a, do we have a pointer, anyone? But what you find out is, is that optimal medical therapy in patients that have normal LV function, actually there's no survival advantage uh, to doing uh, surgery in that particular patient. The far uh, upper uh, right is one vessel disease, two vessel disease down here in the lower left, and three vessel disease in the uh, lower right. Um, there's no difference, thank you. There's, there's no difference in survival in any, in any of these curves, whether you were treated with medicine or, or with surgery. What you did find, though, is that as the LV function decreased, so at EF less than 50, then you start seeing some divergence of the curves for these groups in one vessel, two vessel, and three vessel disease. The study wasn't powered to show a, a statistically significant survival, uh, but uh, we see that the curves are diverging for even one or two or three vessel disease. And that's only in patients with impaired LV function. But what we did find from these stu studies is that you did get a significant reduction in, in angina throughout the entire five-year uh, period, whether it's one vessel, two vessel, or three vessel disease. Revascularizing did the, the, the one thing was to improve the, uh, their uh, uh, treatment of angina. Also, whenever you put them on a stress uh, uh, test, these patients that had uh, coronary bypass surgery were able to uh, up here, were able to walk uh, a lot longer period of time on the treadmill. They were able to do it without uh, angina, and uh, they had much, uh, they were not uh, having any EKG changes during this uh, period of stress. And as well, their use of nitrates if you had cabbage was much less than if you were treated with optimal medical therapy. So the take-home point of this is that cabbage in patients with stable angina is strictly for symptom relief only. There's no survival advantage to that particular uh, subgroup of, of patients who have normal LV function. If you have impaired LV function from that study, you could uh, glean that there may be a survival advantage in that particular group of patients. <clears throat> now, when you looked at the stent uh, therapy as well, and compared optimal medical therapy uh, to uh, stents, uh, what you find is pretty much what you would expect the same thing. Uh, this is a, um, <clears throat> a, uh, a randomized trial with several thousand people where you're looking at medical therapy versus PCI. 
Survival free of death or myocardial infarction, the same. Uh, overall survival, no difference uh, in uh, survival, no difference in uh, acute coronary syndromes, uh, uh, no difference in uh, myocardial infarction, whether you were treated with medicine or whether you were treated with stents. When you looked at a big meta-analysis looking at several studies, you see the same thing, uh, that uh, all-cause mortality for these patients, either less than one year, or one to five years, or five years, there is no survival advantage to stunning patients that have stable coronary artery disease. Non-fatal MIs, same thing. There's no, no improvement versus uh, optimal medical therapy. Need for revascularization does toward the trend towards uh, the favor of the, the patients uh, uh, who uh, would, would have PCI, uh, they, they would not require revascularization. But overall, for stable coronary artery disease, there's no survival advantage, uh, no improvement in MIs uh, at all. And I'll, take, I'll jump very, very far forward to even recent studies where you're looking at doing opening vessels that are totally occluded. When you look at the decision CTO trial, where there, there's techniques where they can open a totally occluded vessel, what you're seeing with that, again, is there is no survival advantage over optimal medical therapy. The MACE rates are the same. Mortality is the same. Repeat re revascularization, there's no difference, no difference in MIs. Uh, and even angina is, sim is similar uh, in the two groups. So take home point, PCI in patients with stable angina, keep in mind, is for symptomatic relief only and does not confer uh, survival advantages or uh, uh, the threat of future MIs. So now, let's, uh, now we'll get into more of the studies of comparing uh, stenting versus uh, surgery. And uh, some of the early uh, studies, we'll, we'll just talk early, real quickly about the, the Berry trial. Uh, and basically in the Berry trial, again, you're taking a very low risk group of patients, mostly type A type uh, lesions because the technology wasn't there either on surgery or, uh, or with stenting to look at more complex uh, diseases. Most of these patients are younger, healthier uh, patients. Um, they would be considered syntax uh, 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 low, low uh, syntax score type uh, patients, and we'll get into syntax here in a little bit. But when you look at these patients, uh, when you looked at the group as a whole, the, the, it looks as a cabbage fares better than uh, P PTCA. If, if the dots to the right, that says it's favoring uh, cabbage uh, for all the different subclassifications here. But if you took out the patients who had uh, did not uh, who uh, had were non-diabetics and looked at them, actually they're pretty much the same. When you break it down and start looking at it, patients who had no uh, diabetes, the cabbage and the stent patients in this low-risk group, the survival is exactly the same. If you looked at patients who are diabetic, who de by definition tend to have uh, much more diffuse uh, nature of their disease, then you do start seeing at 10 years, you're seeing that there's still a pretty big difference in survival for those who were just treated with, uh, with an angioplasty versus those who were treated with coronary artery bypass surgery. What you also saw in this, uh, this study was is that the durability of the therapy was much greater in patients who had coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, if you had a PTCA, your re-intervention rate at five years was uh, approaching 50%. Uh, most of them, if you were, um, uh, had had uh, uh, previous stenting, the biggest thing you, you were going to end up with is, you see here, the repeat operation is, is bypass. Um, a lot of them still had stents, but a lot of them, uh, under, had, almost 30 percent of them had to have bypass at five years. When you looked at the 10-year time frame, the number of subsequent procedures per 100 patients was actually over one uh, procedure per patient, 115.6 subsequent procedures uh, per 100 patients uh, if you had stenting, whereas at 10 years, only 31 percent of the patients that had coronary bypass initially uh, required any subsequent procedures. And also the, the uh, symptomatic relief was pretty durable out uh, to 10 years in the patients that had uh, coronary bypass uh, surgery. 
uh, with uh, 10 years, only 15% of them having angina. So what uh, changed over time? Well, PTCA, we know, is not a very durable uh, therapy. So the stents, as you recall, in 1986 came onto the scene. And so how were stents doing against uh, uh, coronary bypass surgery? This is a meta-analysis, and what I want you to keep in mind is that by today's standards, these are pretty short duration terms, uh, uh, studies, a lot of them one, two uh, years. Uh, very few of them are what we would consider to be long-term studies. Uh, these, are, these are mostly short to intermediate uh, uh, tr term trials. But what you see in these uh, patients, and again, these are all low-risk patients. You had to be able to stent them and, and do coronary surgery. Uh, they were going to be randomized, so it had, they basically had to be equivalent. And in order for it to be equivalent in those days, by definition, they had to be pretty low-risk type uh, lesions that are being treated. What you see in this, when you look at mortality after these types of interventions for these low-risk patients, it's pretty much uh, a draw uh, on that. When you look at prevention of MI, again, sort of scattered, uh, I would still call it a draw for PCI versus cabbage. What you did see is it really favors cabbage in terms of need for subsequent revascularization. So based on these early trials with uh, stents versus cabbage, uh, really the only big advantage is the need for revascularization. Now the cardiologists in the group would be saying, but we didn't have our best uh, stents out there yet. By the same token, the cabbage groups during this time period, there wasn't the understanding that the mammary was the important thing that we were doing there either. So a large portion of these patients uh, were not having mammaries. Now Dave Taggart, he's kind of a, a, a god in the world of cardiac surgery and, and trying to debate this with uh, cardiologists, but he also put together a, a um, a review of the literature, and he, he published it in the annals in 2006. But what he pointed out very obviously in, the, in these early trials is they uh, don't really represent the current population that we're taking care of. Left main, none of them had left main disease in any of those trials. Uh, only 35% of them had three-vessel uh, coronary disease, whereas over 90% of ours have three-vessel disease in, in the standard practice at that time. Uh, the proximal LED was also avoided, uh, only 41% of them. Uh, they all had EFs greater than 100%. Uh, there were very few diabetics in these early studies, and the use of mammary was less than 80% in those uh, early studies uh, at that point in time. So it really doesn't reflect the, the current practice. Um, but the concern is, is that even though this isn't reflective of what's going on in current practice, um, stenting was being generalized, and these studies were being used to generalize to the, um, the, the, uh, the other population of patients that are diabetics that do have EFs uh, less than 50%. Uh, and that's seen in this, this trial where you see, or this study where you start seeing that uh, PTCA uh, is really uh, starting to climb even before the Berry trial didn't come out to 96, 97, that, this time period here. But with the Berry trial, you start seeing that all of a sudden there's a lot more PTCAs being done and a lot fewer uh, cabbages. Uh, it really take, it takes off in, uh, in 1986, obviously, uh, is when the first stents start coming out, but before they start getting real popular, is probably about this time period here uh, where everybody's getting stented and, the, and a, the amount of coronary bypass surgery is going down. But again, remember, there's no survival advantage to that. The only reason to do that is relief of angina, but it's not a durable uh, therapy. So um, what does it look like in the real world? And part of the reason why we're saying this isn't reflective of the real world experience, because those aren't the typical patients we're taking care of. Here's a study that comes out of uh, New York. And in New York, you have to present every patient that has coronary surgery goes to a uh, statewide database. Everyone has a PCI. It goes to a statewide database. 
Well, when they compared the databases and looked at survival uh, curves uh, with patients with two-vessel disease, uh, um, without disease of even the uh, LAD, there is a significant difference in survival at three years. Two-vessel disease with proximal coronary di LAD disease, survival advantage to doing bypass uh, over stenting. Three-vessel disease, even more pronounced survival at three years uh, in these patients. So there is a survival impact in doing these patients, even two-vessel disease uh, patients uh, that we're seeing in the, in the public. And when you looked at the re-intervention rate, if you had stunting, uh, or if you had PCI uh, at three years, almost 30% of them were already having to have PCI, uh, and another almost 10% of them were having to have a coronary bypass by only three years. So even though there's a lot of stunting being done, 40% of them by three years had to go undergo another uh, re-intervention. This is another study where they started looking at what about happens when we use uh, drug-eluting stents, when, when the better stents came out. Same thing in, uh, in um, New York, what you're seeing is statistically significant uh, survival advantages if you have coronary bypass surgery versus uh, stenting. Uh, and that included patients with two-vessel disease, three-vessel disease, uh, again, uh, two-vessel disease, um, Free, these are freedom from MIs down here. So lower freedom, uh, lower MI rates and survival advantage in the real world practice. I've always, uh, I've always said that randomized studies are good if, if, if everybody followed that type of rule, but most of our patients that we have aren't the ones that are going to be uh, following all the rules. And, and, and Chuck can allude to this, this is Copper Basin. You know, you, send, you do a, uh, a stent to somebody in Copper Basin and expect them to actually take their medications. Um, you know, for a year you're going to be on Plavix. Probably unrealistic that that's going to happen in a lot of the real world pe uh, situations. Most people that are signing up for uh, randomized trials are a different type of a person. Uh, so based on that study, CAVI, uh, th that data, cabbage still remains the gold standard, but stents, when you really look at it, this, those, those advantages in survival aren't that bad, uh, and particularly in low-risk patients, the stents actually do a pretty good job um, in terms of survival. It's just a higher interventional rate. Uh, but it's dangerous to generalize the data to, uh, from these randomized trials uh, to the general population. So what happens when you do get to the better stents, the drug-eluting stents, what's, uh, what impact has that had um, on, uh, on the treatment of the disease? Well, when you compared uh, uh, patients uh, who have um, bare metal stents versus drug-eluting stents in the early trials where they were looking at very large vessels, uh, proximal lesions, uh, the, the results in terms of restenosis are are pretty impressive. But when you start getting out into the real world and what's really happening, uh, this is a study out of uh, Norway where they were looking at 20,000 patients that were randomized to either bare metal stents or drug eluting stents. And you're looking out at five, six years past uh, the time that they were randomized. Uh, patients' events rates, and the event was um, uh, have to have a re-intervention or a non-fatal MI, what you see is that uh, the bare metal stents and the drug eluding stents were exactly the same. Death from any cause, there's no survival advantage to using a drug eluding stent over bare metal stents. Uh, the big thing that you notice is a difference is that in the bare metal stents, you are going to have a higher re-intervention re rate than if you used a drug eluding stent. But even at five years, you're looking at over 15% of the drug eluding stents happen to have a, a re-intervention. And it's only about a 5% incidence uh, or difference in the actual amount of uh, re-intervention rates between a bare metal stent and a drug eluting stent in a real world practice. Now let's look at a randomized trial drug eluting stents over coronary bypass surgery. And this study is, is, uh, is a great study in that it, it 
it took into fact that coronary disease is, there are varying degrees of it. Uh, and it, it actually gave them a score based on uh, a scoring model that they developed uh, to try to pick out who is a low risk uh, type score, an intermediate risk or high risk score. And it's based on where the lesion is, whether it's at a bifurcation site, uh, what type of disease is, is associated around the uh, bifurcation. They're able to give these patients a score uh, that would be predictive of the, how much uh, chance they would have of having problems. And after the first year uh, the study came out, I remember the cardiologist coming in and patting me on the bat and say, Larry, it's good to know you, but you know, we're not going to need you anymore. Because when you looked at one year after this trial came out, the death from any cause was the same. There's no statistical uh, significance in it. Death for, uh, or stroke, uh, MI, any of those things, no difference. The MACE rate was higher, but it was all driven by the need for repeat revascularization. At one year, 6% of the cabbage patients required a re intervention versus 13% for the PCI. And the thoughts were, yeah, we just re them, it's not gonna matter. That's at one year, all the heart surgeons in the country are pretty much starting to look about doing gallbladders. What you never hear a lot about is what happened at five years, whenever you started looking at, at these patients and, and carried the data out. What you see there, and this is in three-vessel uh, coronary artery disease, the MACE rates statistically significantly different in MACE rates at uh, five years, uh, with 37% uh, of them having a, an event. Now, granted, a lot of those were a need for revascularization. But uh, when you looked at three-vessel disease again and uh, looking at, uh, uh, that was the, the masonry, I'm sorry, looking at uh, uh, survival advantages. Uh, oh, this, this is death, CVA, or MI, uh, and, not to, and taking out the account of revascularization and what was included in these mace rates you see that at five years, you have an 8% higher incidence of having death, CVA, or an MI uh, in patients that were treated with, uh, with the stenting uh, for three-vessel coronary disease. When you break it down to the syntax score, those, were, those first uh, slides were all looking at the global population, low, intermediate, and high syntax score. If you look at those that were the intermediate syntax score, you see that the, the overall MACE rates were statistically significant. But look more importantly, look at the death rates uh, in those patients with intermediate syntax scores at five years. You have a, almost a 7% raw increase in death rates in that, in that uh, cohort of patients. Your MI rate was 10% higher in that uh, uh, group of patients with only intermediate uh, risk disease. If you look at those who have high syntax scores, the death rate, again, statistically significant, 9% uh, uh, higher rate of, of death at only five years, uh, and your uh, uh, MI rate, 7% uh, higher uh, raw data in, in those patients. The other thing to take home in, the, in these studies is when you look is at five years, these curves are still diverging. There, it's not like they've leveled out. They're still getting farther apart. So what's it gonna look like at 10 years when you look at those? And when we're talking about patients that we're putting stents in, you know, in the 80-year-old, okay, we don't expect them to live that long. But in a 50, 60-year-old uh, patient with this type of disease, it's something you really ought to uh, reconsider what we're doing for the treatment of those uh, patients. When you look at some of the randomized uh, study, studies and do a meta-analysis on them uh, in some of the more um, clinically relevant uh, studies, um, this is a meta-analysis that included not only syntax but it also the freedom trial. What you see in virtually all these, um, you're gonna, this is the mortality uh, limb. It all favor, the, the bulk of it favors uh, cabbage. Uh, in the, particularly in these uh, more relevant uh, later studies. When you look at 
freedom from MI, the all uh, favored uh, coronary bypass over uh, uh, PCI, uh, the need for a repeat vascular revascularization again favors cabbage in, in this uh, group of patients, and the MACE rates obviously uh, uh, definitely favor coronary bypass over uh, PCI. The one thing that doesn't favor surgery is there is a higher stroke rate uh, in, uh, in a lot of these studies uh, in uh, patients who have cabbage versus a PCI. So in, in this uh, study looking at cabbage versus a PCI, uh, the one thing that I want to talk about is why is coronary bypass surgery uh, a favorable uh, approach? Uh, and what I'm going to ask you to look at is particularly these red bars here uh, and over here. What they're looking at here are people that had multiple arterial grafts, bilateral mammaries. When you compare bilateral mammaries to patients that have stunning, the, the advantages uh, in survival and the need for revascularization is much improved in patients that have bilateral mammaries. So we already had studied, and, and I, I'm not going to present the data, but showing that, that, that the mammary was the, the main thing that we were seeing as a cause for our survival benefit. But whenever you looked at these meta-analyses, the ones that, or at this particular study, it was a meta-analysis too, but those that have bi, bilateral mammaries did better. And why is that? Well, it's considering, uh, what's happening with the mammary artery. And there are lots of studies that have shown that the mammary artery is, is an artery that produces more nitric oxide than probably any other uh, uh, vessel in the, in the body. And I actually studied this in the labs at, uh, at Pittsburgh. And the, the amount of nitric oxide generated in those vessels is astronomical. The only vessel I could make do higher is if I would uh, snare a coronary artery for a period of time and do some ischemic re re uh, preconditioning and release it. Then a, you would get a lot more nitric oxide out of those vessels. But the internal mammary, for whatever reason, does produce a lot of nitric oxide. And a downstream effect of that seems to have some impact on the development of downstream disease. If you think about stenting, you're not going past the disease, you're actually going into the disease. We actually go just past that disease and now we have the downstream effect of the, of the mammary and release of nitric oxide to theoretically improve uh, how the, 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 the rest of the vessel is going to do over time. And when this is looking at disease progression of the downstream vessel, if you have an IMA, it's much less progression of the disease in terms of the length of the lesion, the degree of stenosis, or even remodeling of other stenosis down there. Much improved if you have a mammary versus a drug-eluting stent, or, and it's even worse in patients as a, a bare metal stent. All a lot of, a lot of theory, but um, that's the presumed uh, reason for it. But with all the data that I've, I've presented today, uh, and, and granted, I'm presenting it from the, the biased approach of a surgeon. Uh, the question becomes is why are we still seeing such a marked reduction in the number of coronary artery bypass uh, procedures being done? Uh, we see bare metal stents fell off the map for uh, quite some time and almost everybody was getting drug eluting stents. Even though you're not seeing any real big survival advantages, why is this uh, happening? What's tilting the scale one way or the other? And if you ask my cardiac surgery uh, friends, this would be their uh, thought process, is it's these evil cardiologists. But in reality, the, the reason is driven by the patients. Nobody wants to have to go through a, a, a sternotomy uh, and go through all the healing process that you have to. If you can have the stent and, and go home and be back to your life within a, you know, a few days uh, without having to go through the healing process, a lot of people are going to be willing to take that risk of having to have a, um, uh, a repeat stent. Uh, they're not necessarily being told of the, of the, uh, the MI potential and the survival advantage of the other. But is there some way we can all work together and come to an agreement of what's, what can we do that will give these patients that survival advantage of the mammary, the benefits of the mammary, and, and also maintain um, 
the, the minimally invasive approach of, of stenting. And that's where that initial slide uh, or presentation comes in with the, with the robotic patient. And you saw that guy. He was actually, uh, when I saw him in the office at two weeks, he ran five miles the day before just to check the graft out and see how it was doing for me. So pretty impressive. So how do uh, uh, these minimally evasive approaches do versus drug-eluting stents? This is, a, this is a study looking at uh, doing mid-cabs versus, versus stenting. Uh, and this is using the Cypher drug-eluting uh, stent. Uh, at two years, a very short-term uh, trial, you're already seeing statistically significant uh, mace-free survival if you have a uh, mid-cab versus a uh, drug-eluting stent. Same thing, angina, which again, that's the reason why we're doing this, is symptomatic relief in stable angina. We're not doing it for survival advantage. Symptomatic relief at only two years, statistically improved in uh, patients having mid-cabs over patients who were just having uh, uh, stenting. This is a study uh, uh, looking at doing hybrid coronary revascularizations. Again, uh, robotically, much of what I'm doing. So the patient was going to be randomized to either a hybrid where they got uh, a robotic coronary bypass to the uh, LAD and stenting of other territories versus just a standard open uh, cabbage. And when you look at the data, uh, by and large, it's kind of all over, uh, it could, in some areas it favors uh, cabbage, but in a lot of them, the ones to the right is where it's favoring uh, using um, a hybrid approach. And three vessel, this is an early time period uh, at one year. Um, uh, you're seeing uh, uh, advantage in people who had three vessel disease, they actually did better with a hybrid approach. And people that have higher STS scores, sicker patients, they tend to do better with hybrid approaches, and that, and that even held out at these uh, uh, longer uh, time points. So this hybrid approach, you're not seeing a lot of differences uh, in the eventual outcomes. The big difference is, is the, uh, the invasiveness that the patients uh, were able to avoid by uh, not having a standard cabbage. This is a multi-institutional study, again, looking at the same sort of approach of the hybrid revascularization. And what you see is after 15 months, the red curves were the patients who were treated with all stenting. The blue is the ones that have the hybrid, uh, they have the lima to the LED uh, and, uh, and stents to the other territories. At 15 months, the curves start to diverge, uh, showing the, the survival advantage or the, the improvement in base rates. Uh, from having used a, a mammary at that sh short time period. This is uh, just a, a slide sort of showing, um, you know, what we're doing in the operating room. If I can get it to play. Computer's thinking. But what happened with the robots is that uh, over time, uh, the da Vinci it came out with an articulating arm and I can really do a lot of the same things that I can do in an open approach. I can do the exact same things just as easily using a robotic approach. And, and what you see here is a cautery and, and uh, uh, I'm taking down the left mammary. There's uh, the veins, the, this one here and the arteries, the, the clear one here. This is a guy that I did on Friday last week. You have very good visualization of the vessels uh, and very, very easy to, to take down the memory using this approach. Here I'm uh, opening the pericardium to expose the, uh, to expose the uh, actual artery. Peter's thinking. But this is the, the pericardium here. This is the heart underneath of the of the, the pericardium. Okay. It doesn't want to play. Uh, and then here's the the pericardium's open. Uh, this is the mammary that I've taken down and, and the actual LEDs there. Let's see if this one here will play a little faster for us. Yeah. 
updates. Thank you. Okay, it's not going to do it. But basically what I line up is the, this is the LAD right here. Here's the memory. Everything's all set up. I just uh, take out the robot at that time, extend the, the, the port uh, incision where I had the scope, and then directly so the, the memory to the LED. Despite this being fairly minimally invasive and being able to send patients home sometimes as early as the very next day, most patients on a, looking at our data here right now, the average is three days. Um, despite being able to, to do that, there's still a lot of diversity in treatment. Uh, uh, and diversity in treatment of cabbage versus stunt. If you look at the United States, there's a, uh, when you look at the number of PCIs per cabbages, uh, pretty diverse. And this, these are various countries. Some of them, there's not a big difference in cabbage versus uh, stunting, but in certain uh, countries like Germany, uh, Belgium, United States, there's really a, a preponderance of patients that are getting uh, stunting. This is looking at uh, uh, Ontario. Um, some of these programs are only 40 miles apart from them, but there's a five times difference in the, in the PCI versus cabbage rate uh, in certain areas. Only 4% of these patients were ever discussed at a multidisciplinary uh, meeting to try to decide what's the best therapy for those. And these are with even very standardized um, right and wrong approaches to coronary disease. This is the ECATS in 2014. In, the, in, the, uh, in America, we have our own scoring of what's uh, level uh, class indication it is. It's a little more cumbersome than this. But here, we're uh, looking at just three vessel disease that we discussed today. 79% of our patients are following NS 23 to 32. Uh, and it's a red box, or it's a three, level three indication uh, for uh, the treatment of that uh, disease, and it's a one for surgery. But yet, there's a lot of patients that are in this that are, are getting uh, stented. So because of that, and, and because of this next slide is why I'm saying you really need to have a multidisciplinary approach to treatment of coronary artery disease in, in, the, in the world today. This is a study looking at 10 U.S. hospitals, and they asked the patients who had stable coronary artery disease, why did you have your procedure? What, what was the reason for it to be done? Over 90% of these patients said it was done to save their life. And we know from the data that I presented today that's not true. Even the slide of the patient that I did the robotic bypass in mammary in, uh, in York you remember him saying it saved his life. It didn't save his life. Uh, we know that from the data. 90% of the people think they're having it done to prevent future myocardial infarctions. 80-some percent of them think that it's there to extend their, their life. Only 1% of the people surveyed said it was for symptomatic relief only. And that's the only thing that we know that any type of revascularization in a patient with stable coronary artery disease, the only reason you're doing it are for symptomatic relief. And that's why I would highly advocate for two things, a multidisciplinary approach, and sorry, Allison, but cabbage wins. I actually have a kind of a simple question. So there's a subset of patients for whom no intervention is really, who have chronic stable angina, for whom no intervention is necessary, if you can control their symptoms on medicine. So how do you decide who to, how do you decide who to study to find out whether or not they have one or two or three vessel disease or something like that? So if somebody comes in for chronic stable angina, how do you start my opinion is just send them straight to surgery, but Walter Fuse right back there, and he, he's the guy who's going to draw the pictures, and he can tell you why, how he's going to decide. <laughs> 
question I had was you have a high risk patient, right? There's somebody who's had a bad treadmill, they're diabetic, low EF. How, how do you, do you do all of the, all of the revascularization in the operating room? Is it all done with the Da Vinci? How do you decide whether it's Da Vinci versus open, that sort of thing? So the, the, the answer is, is that I can do every single bypass through a little incision. I've bypassed rights, PDAs, uh, um, OMs. I've done the entire four vessel bypass through that same incision. The problem with it is, is uh, it's a pretty difficult thing to do, uh, that. And if you ask me, and, and, and there's no other heart surgeons in the room, I'll argue that a stent is going to be almost equal to a vein bypass. And I only got two mammaries to work with. So I was, for a while, doing it where I was doing all the bypasses through that little incision. Uh, but. I would prefer to just take the advantage of the mammary and let those guys put stents in them, knowing that it's probably going to be as good as that vein graft. Now what we do in trying to decide whether it's going to be a hybrid case or a standard open case is really I sit down with, with Walter or, or whichever cardiologist and we look at what is the I'll take care of the LED, but what does the remaining vessels look like in terms of their dur durability of stents? If they're at a really complex bifurcation site that's more likely to go down, and it's a lot of myocardium that's going to go at risk if that stent were to go down, that patient's probably going to get an open bypass. If it looks like it's a good uh, lesion uh, to be treated and, and Walter's comfortable in, in fixing it, then, then, we, uh, then we'll go with a hybrid approach for that particular patient. But it's really dictated by the anatomy that I can do a lima rema, so I'll be able to do a lima the LED, a rema to a, high di to a diagonal, a ramus or a high OM. I can do those pretty easily through that small approach. Um, but if it's anything else, uh, I really discuss it with those guys. It really has to be a team approach as to who can get it. Dr. Fry. So we, uh, I used to do radials and everybody I used to do a lot of all arterial grafts. I was part of the Ruby trial where we took uh, uh, and randomized uh, patients to off pump or on pump surgery. And what you found, and all these patients got cath at one year. Uh, and although the radial artery um, gets a lot of, it's an arterial graft, it should be good. Uh, the patency rate at one year was inferior to vein grafts, um, even at one year. The problem with radial grafts uh, is that um, you have to have at least a 90% lesion or that they are going to spasm. These things were done early in heart surgery back in the 70s, Carpentier was using them. And the only reason they came back was all of a sudden, patients that had their surgery in the 70s, 80s were getting cath in the, in the 90s, early 2000s, and the grafts that were shown to be occluded at one point in time were all of a sudden open again several years down the, the road. As that lesion got tighter, they reopened up. And so that's why there was that, that reinvigoration in the use of, of the radial arteries. The problem is, is that to take it minimally invasively, and you can, um, requires a lot of extra money uh, to do it, or the patient's going to have a big scar up and down their arm. Uh, and uh, uh, my thought, and there's no survival advantage ever been shown to it. Double mammaries, though, there is a survival advantage to it. When you look at uh, Bruce Lytle's data out of the Cleveland Clinic, there is a survival advantage to using bilateral mammaries. They don't diverge till 10 years, uh, but I would take that survival advantage over two mammaries rather than a mammary and a, and a radial that doesn't necessarily show me a survival advantage. Second question, are there any improvements in the bypass system which uh, we have problem with cognition after the bypass? So again, when you looked at off-pump, versus on pump. When I'm doing these robotic bypasses, they're virtually all off pump, so they're never on a bypass, so you don't have to worry about the, the cognition uh, uh, concerns of having had a bypass run. Another reason why I, 
I like doing the robotic surgery. Uh, we again looking at the Ruby trial, uh, randomizing to off pump and on pump. The the degree of revascularization was improved in on pump, and when you really look at it, there's a survival ad advantage to being on pump. In Toronto and other provinces, areas of Canada, you will not be paid if you do off-pump surgery uh, because of the, of the survival advantage. Thank you very much. Thanks.